Well, good morning everyone and welcome to day 11 in the book of Proverbs. I love this book. I've got a Bible in a year reading plan that's extremely simple. I cut it into three chunks, so New Testament, Old Testament poetry of which Proverbs is a part, and then the rest of the Old Testament. And I read a little chunk of one of, of all three, even, every day. But I save the book of Proverbs until last because I just love it so much. There's so much here that just teaches us how to live. Just common sense stuff or just such wisdom. And that is how it opens, isn't it? Get wisdom. And so I want to share some wisdom from chapter 11 today. I'm going to read it for you. It's a long chapter, so please be patient with me. Please be patient when I keep turning to my Bible, my iPad, my phone to look at you. I've not done this before. So it's a learning curve for all of us. Um, I'm going to read it to you in the New Living Translation. That's my favourite version. It's a nice, real version. It reads nicely. And occasionally you have to look things up to make sure that you really do understand what it means. So the Lord, it says, detests the use of dishonest scales, but he delights in accurate weights. Pride leads to disgrace, but with humility comes wisdom. Honesty destroys good people. Dishonesty destroys treacherous people. Riches won't help on the day of judgment, but right living can save you from death. The godly are directed by honesty. The wicked fall beneath their load of sin. The godliness of good people rescues them. The ambition of treacherous people traps them. When the wicked die, their hopes die with them, for they rely on their own feeble strength. But the godly are rescued from trouble, and it falls on the wicked instead. With their words, the godless destroy their friends, but knowledge will rescue the righteous. The whole city celebrates when the godly succeed, and they shout for joy when the wicked die. Upright citizens are good for a city and make it prosper. But the talk of the wicked tears it apart. It is foolish to belittle one's neighbour. A sensible person keeps quiet. A gossip goes around telling secrets, but those who are trustworthy can keep a confidence. Without wise leadership, a nation falls. There is safety in having many advisers. There's danger in putting up security for a stranger's debt. It's safer not to do that. A gracious woman gains respect, but ruthless men gain only wealth. Your kindness will reward you, but your cruelty will destroy you. Evil people get rich for the moment, but the reward of the godly will last. Godly people find life. Evil people find death. The Lord detests people with crooked hearts, but he delights in those with integrity. Evil people will surely be punished, but the children of the godly will go free. A beautiful woman who lacks discretion is like a gold ring in a pig's snout. And I'm not even going to comment on that verse. The godly can look forward to a reward, while the wicked can expect only judgment. Give freely and become more wealthy. Be stingy and lose everything. The generous will prosper. Those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. People curse those who hoard their grain, but they bless the one who sells in time of need. If you search for good, you'll find favour. But if you search for evil, it will find you. Trust in your money and down you go. But the godly flourish like leaves in spring. Those who bring trouble on their families inherit the wind. The fool will be a servant to the wise. The seeds of good deeds become a tree of life, and a wise person wins friends. 
If the righteous are rewarded here on earth, what will happen to wicked sinners? So there is so much in this chapter and I'm not going to be able to bring it all out. But it's basically about the contrast between the godly, that's us, and the wicked, that's people who don't follow Christ. I want to concentrate on verse 30, which is quite a famous verse really. And you'll have perhaps heard it in the authorised version where it says, he who wins souls is wise. In my version, I like this, it says a wise person wins friends because I think although it is about winning other people for Christ, as we heard so eloquently on Sunday, saving places, getting in the family portrait, actually, I think there's a broader meaning than that. Because if we're going to win friends, then our message is going to be that much more powerful. I always remember Charlotte Gamble saying, whoever you make a friend of is no threat to you. And they were wise words. So I want to start by telling you how not to win friends. It's my story. And I want to tell you about the time when I left university and I had to choose a career to aim for. It was the first major decision that I'd made with the Lord and I felt on the basis of having visited a probation hostel with a friend of mine for several years at uni that I wanted to be a social worker, that this was what God had for me. So after two years in this church, two years a Christian, I took advice from my wise pastor who'd given me much wise advice over these two years, but this one really backfired on me. And the advice he gave me was to nail my colours to the mast. And I did. So, when I arrived in Nottingham, there were about 20 people on the course and bit by bit I got to know them. And each one I would tell them within two minutes that yes, I was a Christian. Well, the good bit was I found two more people who were also Christians. But the whole thing really backfired on me in the second term when we started to do group work. And the way it was done was to bring in a visiting professor who would sit within the group and every now and again he would say something which was quite disconcerting. And he would kind of say what he thought was going on. Well, in about the second session, the whole group turned on me and began to tell me how much they didn't appreciate the way I'd shared my faith with them within minutes of meeting them. Well, it was shattering, and I'm afraid this experience stayed with me for years. However, I did learn from it, and I'm happy to say that I learnt in a good way. It may have been partly down to the group I was in, because they were a bolshie lot, they really were. But what I learnt was in verse 2. And I kind of want to concentrate on this and on what it says about our words later on. So verse 2 says, pride leads to disgrace and with humility comes wisdom. I wasn't showing much humility. It just so happens that I was reading this morning Thessalonians alongside my Proverbs. And in chapter 2, the Apostle Paul even talks about how he behaved to those people who he was seeking to win for Christ and make disciples of. And he says he was gentle among them, like a mother with her little children. In other words, he was sharing his life with them and giving of himself. And I believe that in this chapter, there are one or two real keys. I can't mention them all because there's so much in this chapter in which we can follow the Apostle Paul's example in that our lives speak as loudly as our words do. So in verse 2, it tells us that one of the keys how to win friends is to be humble, to have a teachable spirit. Who likes a know-all? I know I don't, and I expect you don't either. Some of the greatest people that we've all heard of are humble, teachable people. There's always something we can learn from any situation. And one of the key things is that we learn to listen. 
And as we listen to people, they're going to start confiding in us. And it's important how we treat those confidences. If we skip from here to verse 9, it talks about how the godless destroy their friends with their words and how knowledge will rescue the righteous. In verses further on, it goes about how a gossip goes around telling secrets. Those who are trustworthy can keep a confidence. And how it's foolish to belittle your neighbour. Foolish words, in other words, and wise words, and the difference between them. So our words are massively important, and sometimes our lack of words is even more important. We need to learn to listen so that people will confide in us. And the words that we speak need to be creative words. Because after all, we're made in the image of God, aren't we? How did God make the world? Well, he spoke the word and it was created. Our words are creative words. They can build people up, they can tear them down and careless words can just tear down everything that we've been trying to build. Listen to people. They'll start confiding in us and when they do, it's very important that we keep their confidences. One church we were in, there was a lady who was well known and the saying went round that if you want something to get round the whole church, tell this lady that it's a confidence and she's got to keep it to herself and within days everyone will know exactly what's going on. And that used to be exactly what happened. And we don't have to be like that. If we're going to make friends and influence people, we need to be able to keep those confidences and show ourselves to be trustworthy and a true friend. We need to have God's agenda, verse 6. Who makes a friend of someone who we know jolly well has their own agenda? They can say something nice. When they say something nice, we know very well they want something. That friendship isn't going to last. So it's good to say nice things to people, but it's good to have God's agenda and not our own. It's not that we want something, but we're listening to the Holy Spirit and asking him what he wants us to be saying to these people. Yes, to make them feel good, but not for any reason apart from that we want to win them in a good way so that our lives will speak to God, for God even. The godly, it says, are kind and gracious, verses 16 and 17. How do we react when someone wrongs us? And I want to finish by telling you a story of another friend of mine. Now, this lady was very well known in the area. She had a fantastic women's ministry. She was very much a friend and a mentor to me. And I always remember her saying one thing to me, Hilda, when people wrong you, how quickly do you forgive and move on? Really challenge me, but I've never respected her more than when the whole thing turned on its head for her. She was sacked from the position that she was in for no good reason. And it was, it was devastating for her. And I still remember the day that she rang up and said, Hilda, I'd like to come and see you. I want to come and forgive all the people that have wronged me and I want you to be my witness. And she did. We were both in tears and I have never respected her more than when I saw her do exactly what she'd always instructed me to do. It was an object lesson. The godly look for the best in every situation and every person. If you go looking for bad stuff, it will find you. Finally, by implication, the godly are a blessing, even in their own families. It's no good you trying to be good to other people if in your own family, everyone knows what you're like behind the closed doors, is it? 
and back to verse 30, where I started about how a wise person can win friends. It tells us that the seeds we sow of listening to people, keeping their confidences, being trustworthy, being gracious, being kind, being merciful, that those seeds will bear fruit, maybe not straight away, maybe not even in those people that we've sowed in. But I do believe that as we seek to win friends in the way that we're being told, that he will have us winning the hearts and minds of those people who are precious to him. Thank you so much for your patience today. Have a great day and see you hopefully on Sunday. God bless you all.